My name is Ethan Pransky. I'm a software developer at Aspire. I've been at Aspire for about two and a half years now, and up until just last week, I was in a team called Partner Development Solutions, so this is a different team. And basically, the, the task of Partner Development Solutions is that we're responsible for all the outbound communication to our partner networks. Um, so I'll explain what that means in a moment. Okay, so we're here to talk about handling data at scale. And when we're talking about handling data at scale, we're usually talking about data streams, right? We usually have some kind of raw data that we want to manipulate in some way, shape, or form, and possibly communi communicate it somewhere or store it for future use, right? And we want to do this as quickly, as cheaply as possible. And usually our systems start out simple enough so that these data streams are easy enough to conceptualize and, and uh, optimizing for scale isn't, isn't that hard. And usually these, these sorts of simple systems um, come with you know, smaller scale. But as we've grown, as AppSpire has grown, we get to these sort of really complicated uh, architectures, right? This is actually a real diagram of AppSpire's tech stack. I have no idea what all these services are, and that's kind of the problem, right? Is that as these architectures get larger and as we're handling more and more data, we both need to be able to debug our, our large scale systems for and learn how to optimize for scale, but they also become more and more difficult to understand on a high level. And there's no way anybody in our organization can understand everything that's going on here, right? But we all understand basic principles of computer science and how and, and how everything works, or everybody who's working at Autonomo or Aspire or, or in this industry of smart people. And we just need to understand where the problem is in order to solve it, right? But that's not always an easy task, okay? And you know, when we're facing scaling challenges, we may not always have the intimate understanding of every service in our pipeline in order to immediately understand what's causing a lack of performance. So we need an easy way to, get, to quickly get into a digestible context so we can use our understanding to properly fix issues. And actually the ideal is, as engineers, we're not here to be spending our time debugging scale issues. We're here to be building features. That's how we provide value. Whenever we're debugging scale issues, it's either because we're not meeting some kind of SLA to our clients, or it's because we're trying to lower our bottom line. These aren't the things that we're trying to do, right? We're trying to build, we're trying to increase our top line. So we want to spend as little time as possible on scale optimization. And when we're talking, we can talk, actually sum up scale optimizations, we're looking for bottlenecks, right? We all talk about bottlenecks all the time. Where's the bottleneck? How can we uh, free up the bottleneck? And while these might be easier or hard to identify at a high level, we often lack the granular context and understand what the correct fix should be. Should we parallelize? Should we parallelize? Or is there some kind of inefficiency in our code which can be improved? Is there some kind of external factor which is degraded performance? Especially when we're working on legacy systems or services written by others, we need a systematic way to debug these quickly and correctly before having to learn the service inside. <laughs> this is uh, Donald Knuth. He's Knuth. Knuth. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. He's a professor at uh, Stanford. He's a mythical figure in computer science. And he has this quote that says, um, "We often see a short inner loop whose speed governs the overall program." to a remarkable degree. So what he's saying here is that actually um, most of our programs in terms of scale isn't really relevant. It's actually, there's a really small amount. I think in the, in the same paper he says something about like, you know, 10% of the, of, of the code is actually relevant to the performance of, the code, of, your, of your applications. And, uh, and so this really, this makes sense. This is what our bottlenecks are, is these short, these small parts of our code, small parts of our system we're trying to live for, we're trying to free those up. 
And actually, queuing theory gives us both the language and the techniques in order to find those small parts of code. Okay? Um, and it does so by giving us a language to describe our systems and mathematical models for quantifying their potential. So for the rest of this talk, I want to explain some basic attributes of queuing theory, uh, which, are the which are at the core for uh, the goal to, for optimizing for scale. And I'll use uh, a case in which we have to quickly adapt to an existing mission critical service in our pipeline to a massive increase in incoming traffic and show how these attributes guided us to the correct solution in a short amount of time with very little developer effort. And I hope through this vehicle, through this example, you understand the importance and power of these principles and be able to utilize them in your own data streams and pipelines. And what I want to explain basically is that if we can break down and abstract our systems first into series of queuing systems, it makes the task of bottleneck detection, uh, finding that short inner loop, uh, much simpler. And also hints at the solution uh, to the bottleneck itself, to, to, to freeing up that bottleneck. <laughs> And it removes the guessing game from scale optimization and helps us focus on the details of the important part of our code instead of being clouded by all the implementations of our systems and services. And actually, this, this connection between queuing theory and, and software development isn't anything new. The, the idea of packet switching, um, which is the basis for TCP, which is the basis for the whole entire internet, is based on work done by Leonard Kleinrock. This is Leonard Kleinrock. He was he's credited with sending the first um, packet or a packet switch network back in 1969. And the, the principles that he developed in queuing theory at MIT were responsible for, um, for, for all the principles behind packet switching and TCP. So congestion control, store and forward, all these principles are based on queuing theory. So we should borrow from these ideas and extend them to our own mind. OK, so before we get into it, I want to explain a little bit about AppSpire, what we do, give you some context here. <laughs> AppsFlyer, we're a mobile attribution uh, company. What does that mean? It means that our clients are mobile app developers. And there's basically, we're here to solve a, a simple problem. When our, our, our clients or our, uh, mobile app developers, they need to bring more users. And how do they bring more users? They advertise. And they advertise on the thousands of different um, platforms in the world, Facebook, Google, et cetera. And when a user, actually, when a user installs, their application, they don't know um, which advertisements they saw before they, they advertised. They don't know how to attribute the, uh, the user to a certain ad, and they don't know how to optimize their budgets. They need a solution like AppSpire in order to provide that answer. So basically, the way that AppSpire works is that we have our SDK, uh, our, our, our clients integrate our SDK on their devices. And whenever there's an install or any in-app event, um, it fires an event to our web servers. And today, um, that sums up to over 80, I think it's actually closer to 90 billion events per day that are coming in, and peaks of over 1 million events per second that we're receiving over HTTP to our web servers. Okay? And that's actually a number that's, that's, that's doubled, I think, twice since I started at AppSwire. So when I first started, we were handing on the order of 20 billion, now we're handing over, over 80 billion. So pretty, pretty large growth. And this is kind of a, on a very, uh, this is like a famous slide that a lot of people use, a slide at AppSpire. Uh, it kind of shows what, what AppSpire looks at uh, like on a high level. We have those, uh, our, you know, our, our clients' devices sending events to, to our web handlers. And basically the backbone of our whole microservices infrastructure is Kafka. And, um, and basically we use, we use Kafka because it, it helps us decouple all of our microservices. Lots of people use it. Um, by the way, if anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Excuse me. Because I'm also including uh, in-app events, so it's, so it's, so there's uh, so there's downstream events. So, so there could be the initial install, which you're right, isn't that on that order. But then we actually our our uh, our clients are interested in not just that we've we've actually expanded our solution to not just be a mobile attribution provider, but we run a suite of uh, of solutions, and a lot of those are based on. Um, what's happening downstream, what a user is doing, whether they're purchasing, um, you know, all sorts of things. Can, you know. Anyways, um, what happens is we have this, uh, this incoming event, we have this initial attribution that happens, and then 
that event, uh, after it gets attributed, gets passed off to the partner development solutions team, and we decide um, who we want to communicate that event back to. Okay, and that's what happens on this bottom right part here. Okay, and what that looks like, if we zoom in, is, is like this. Okay, there's there's a few services above there. Actually, there's three core services in that in that postback. So a postback is just an HTTP request that we send to our partner networks. And there's three microservices. There is a rule engine service who takes an SDK event after it's been attributed and decides to whom we should send a postback and what that postback should look like, what data it should include. When it finishes making those decisions, it, it publishes to Kafka. Then there's a service that we call Authentico, which is the nickname, don't ask me why. And that's responsible for actually doing all the network IO, so it's sending the HTTP requests, receiving the responses. When it gets that response, it passes off to another Kafka uh, queue that a post-processing service takes and decides uh, where to log it and what other uh, post-back post activities we need to do. Okay? So everything was uh, was running on fine. I'd been at the company for about, I don't know, over six months. And then this happened. This client, Hotstar. Hotstar is a, is a video streaming company out of India. And it just so happened, I think it was, I forget exactly what it was, that they had received the exclusive rights to stream all the Indian Premier League cricket season. For those of you who don't know, cricket is massive. I think it's like the number three or four, uh, third or fourth league in the world in terms of in terms of viewership. So there's like the NFL, the NBA, the English Premier League, and the Indian cricket. So this was massive, and we weren't really ready for it. And what happened was is that basically. Basically, overnight, our, the amount of events that we had to handle, especially at peak time, um, more than doubled. Okay, and we really weren't ready for this. We had this, uh, this massive influx, and we started getting all sorts of alerts. And and actually, what what it looked like in in partner development solutions was like this: our rule engine service was handling this fine, and but what, the problem was that the technical the service was responsible for sending HTTP requests um, it, it had a bottleneck. Okay, and we started accruing uh, messages in Kafka, it's known as Kafka lag. And so this is that thing. And what, and what, this, what this manifests itself in is uh, massive delays in, in communicating those events back to the partner network. So we weren't meeting all sorts of SLAs for, for communicating these events back to our partner networks. And usually we know how to handle these situations. We have an in house service that we call Santa, which is responsible for provisioning and it's also responsible for auto scaling. We can Define uh, metrics based on Graphite, the time series database, um, to determine when we want to upscale or downscale our services. Okay, and basically, uh, as a cost-saving measure, we run a lot of our services on Amazon EC2 spots. And spots, for those of you who don't know, are uh, I guess uh, leftover machines from Amazon that you can purchase for for less money. But the catch is that they can take them from you whenever they want. There's not always inventory for you to take advantage of. So we need to know how to program around these, we need to know how to take advantage of these. And so we had this mechanism, and so so obviously uh, immediately when we had this Kafka lag, we started scaling up our service. But there is actually a natural limit when you're working with Kafka, and the natural limit of how many instances you can have consuming from Kafka is how many partitions are defined for your topic, okay? Let's grab the Kafka taxonomy for those of you who don't know in, in a moment, but basically, the, the partitions are the subunits of, of a logical unit called a topic, which is which you can consume from. And actually, you can't have more than one consumer per partition, so you have a natural limit of, of the, the predefined uh, uh, number of partitions is the maximum amount of consumers. And it's really difficult on the fly to reconfigure your partitions for a lot of reasons which I won't get into, but it's, it, it's not a great solution to try to reconfigure the amount of partitions you have on the fly. So when we maxed out the, the number of instances of, of tentacle that we had, and we still weren't keeping up with the traffic, the only other thing we could try is we said, well, let's try uh, you know larger instance types. Let's try machines that have more power. Let's see if they can handle more load. And unfortunately, they they did. Uh, we we were, we were we doubled the tripled the size of the machines, and we just weren't taking advantage of the resources that were available to us. As we as we increased the machines, we, we could see very clearly that. We just weren't taking advantage of the CPU resources that were available to us. So this pointed to a problem with elasticity, right? So um, 
you know, the next day, after a day or two, we could reconfigure our Kafka topic to have more partitions, but this actually pointed to, to a weakness in our, in our infrastructure, right? Because when we were using uh, spots, we need to be able to be flexible enough to use all sorts of different types of hardware, and, and we weren't. And we weren't able to take advantage of this, and, and, and it showed that there was some kind of problem in our service that we weren't able to take advantage of, of strong machines. So this is a problem that we needed to, to handle uh, very urgently. Um, because these kind of spikes could happen at any time. And I hadn't been at the in partner development solutions for that long, and I have sort of a mentor here that pointed to this idea and said, you should look at this idea, these ideas from queuing theory to, to help you guide your way in understanding how to reconfigure the service and understand what the problem is. I call this guy the Jesus, because uh, nobody fucks with him. And anyways, he told me, uh, look into queuing theory, and, and that's kind of set me down a rabbit hole for, for, for learning about queuing theory and learning about what it can teach us about, about, uh, about our systems. And so I'll, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some basic ideas from queuing theory that, uh, that are important to understand. Queuing theory is all about understanding uh, a queuing system. And a queuing system is any system in which you have a, uh, a service node and a waiting area, OK? And, and at, at the highest level, you have an arrival rate, which is the, the number of units or customers or events or however you want to call them arriving to your system. And you have a server, service rate, the, the, the rate at which you can handle um, messages or, or customers or whatever. And there's this idea that's called uh, steady state. So steady state in queuing theory is whenever your arrival rate is lower than your service rate, you're at a steady state. Okay. And this is defined in queuing theory as this, this variable. So we're, first, I want to take a step back. We're going to get into a little bit of math here. It should be too complicated, but stop me if anything isn't comfortable, but it isn't understandable. So this, so this variable called intensity, which is your arrival rate divided by your service rate. And as long as that is lower than 1, then we're at a steady state. And the steady state has some, some pretty strong implications. So when we're at a steady state, um, this rule applies. There's this law called uh, Little's Law, which was developed by an MIT professor named John Little, still alive, still a professor at MIT. And he, and he proved this law back in the 60s um, that this holds up in every single queuing system. And what it says is that the number of units in your system, on average, is equal to the average arrival rate to your system times the average time spent in your system. And when we're at a steady state, your arrival rate will equal your throughput. So your arrival rate will equal your exit rate of your system okay, when you're at a steady state. And Little's Law has this really interesting property that it actually, it actually breaks down. Okay? So where you, whereas you can apply this law at a high level at a, at a queuing system, let's say your queuing system is a sports stadium and you have people queuing out in front, you can apply Little's Law and you can understand uh, how, how your system is interacting. You, get, you can actually apply Little's Law also to just the queue and also just the stadium to understand how many people are waiting in line at a given time, uh, the, the pace at which they're, they're getting through the line and the time they're spending in the line, and the same in, in the stadium itself. So how many people are in the stadium at a given time, being processed in the stadium, uh, the rate and the time spent in there. And actually, we can actually break that down even further so we can understand in this scenario, so maybe we have people queuing up at a stadium, but maybe inside the stadium before they get to their seat, they're actually waiting at a ticketing area, and then before they go to their seat, they go to a snack stand, they wait in a line there, and only then they go to their, to their seat. And actually the sum of the waiting time and, and the number of people waiting in those, in those two subsystems, the ticketing system and the snack system, um, Will will sum up to equal the 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 rate and and the sum and, and the pace at which people are being processed through the stadium as a whole. Try to explain this a little bit more with an example. And also, what this tells us is that when we have these these sequential systems, that a really important principle to understand is that the throughput of the lowest throughput of the of the lowest subsystem of, of, of our subsystems will be the throughput of the system as a whole. So if we have that subsystem that I described, so if we have a ticketing area and we have a, a security check, let's say, if we have an arrival rate of 200 uh, fans a minute arriving to the ticketing area, 
and, and it can only handle uh, 100 fans per minute, and then that 100 fans per minute, uh, that defines the arrival rate of the security area, and even though there we can handle 250 fans per minute, the, the throughput of the system as a whole will still only be 100 fans per minute. Okay? This is what actually defines our bottlenecks, right? This, this, this phenomenon. Okay? And, um, and so you can see how, how these subsystems actually uh, combine together to actually form a system as a whole. Okay, so with these principles in mind, okay, we can start understanding, we can start trying to break down our, our, our technical system, right? And we try to start trying to understand what these, what these tools can tell us. And so at a high level, when we're talking about a queuing system, what's our queuing system here? Uh, Kafka is our waiting area, is our queue, and the technical is our service processor. And just to define a little bit about Kafka, this is kind of, I don't know if it's understandable from the slide, but this is kind of the Kafka taxonomy. Um, usually we define a consumer group, which is a, a number of consumers who all consume from a single topic. And, and what, but what they're actually doing is they're actually they're not consuming from the topic as much as they're consuming from the partitions within the topic. So partitions are, are separate parts of the topic as a whole, which each have partial data of the topic, and each of them are their own queues. Okay, so each of them have their, their, own, uh, their own offsets, and each of them are, just as it sounds, queues. And a consumer can, can consume from one or more partitions, but we can't have more than one consumer on a partition. So that was something that I couldn't go before. And the way that we decide, the way that we de that we can define uh, the length of our queue for our purposes is by, by by consumer lag. And consumer lag in Kafka is defined by the highest offset of a partition, so the latest offset that was that was that was produced, uh, minus the, the the latest offset that I as a consumer has consumed. So that's my my Kafka lag, and that's my queue lag. Okay. Okay, so with that in mind, this is kind of what our system looked like at the time when uh, when we had this problem. Okay, we had uh, an arrival rate of 3,000 messages per second trying to enter into our Kafka partition, and there's nothing holding it back. You can think of Kafka as a, a queue of infinite size, right? Even though technically it has a limit, um, for our sakes and purposes, it, it we don't it doesn't really have a limit. So it, so because it doesn't have a limit, it doesn't cause any back pressure to services producing to it. And then we have our, our tentacle, we have a metric to understand how long it was taking from end to end for a message to go through an instance of the tentacle. And on average, it was taking uh, three quarters of a second to get through, uh, get through the tentacle. And our throughput was only 2,000 messages per second. So because our, our arrival rate was greater than our, our service rate, uh, we weren't at a steady state, and that's why we had this Kafka lag, right? So our queue was just growing. Okay, so we can plug these numbers into uh, Little's Law and try to understand, try to start getting some intuition here. Well, what's happening? So we do when we plug this, these numbers into Little's Law, we get our 2,000 uh, messages per second rate, 0.75 uh, second waiting time, and it comes out to 1,500. Okay, so that's a weird number, 1,500. Um, because we only have one service processor, right? So where does this number 1500 come from? Well, we can lean on this, this principle we know from before that, that, that we can break down our systems into subsystems, right? And so because that math doesn't work out, we should break down our system into subsystems to try to understand what's going on here. And this is what happens when, when we break down our system, we try to understand what's happening in between. So when we looked at the code, on, at the first thing we could notice is that we had three subsystems within, within the tentacle. Okay, we had a consumer, consuming from our, our Kafka queue, we already described. We had a bounded queue of a size of 200 messages um, to which it produced. And then we had a sender component, which was sending, which was actually doing the HTTP request, receiving the response, and then publishing the response to another bounded queue of size 200. And then we had another thread, which was taking from that queue and actually producing to the next Kafka queue. So there's a lot happening here on this slide, so Try to explain exactly what's happening here, and then, and what was happening is we were sending these these HTTP requests uh, asynchronously, and we had a mechanism that limited the amount of uh, HTTP requests we could send at a time, so that we had in flow. Okay, and that that was limited to a thousand at a time. 
And and these queues were, were, were filled up, and that mechanism was also filled up to 1,000. So that's actually, we got to that number from before. Remember, we said that we, we had uh, 1,500 uh, messages in flight. And so that's basically how we more or less got to that to that number. Okay, So we can actually see that, that Moodle's not worked here. So the, that one system broke down into these multiple subsystems. Okay? okay, So this is cool. We understand how this works. But where's the bottleneck? What's, what's the problem here? We can see that these two. Uh, bounded queues here were, were, were full, okay? And, and that's the way the queuing theory works. The, 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 the phenomenon of, that we call back pressure is just this idea is that whenever we have a bounded queue, and when a new message tries to, to enter when that queue is full, then it has to either be dropped or we have to hold it somewhere. And we take advantage of the phenomenon of, of blocking, blocking threads in our, in our systems in order to, to just stop the thread and say, I'm not going to produce anymore, I'm going to stop my system, until uh, until there's until there's space in this into the queue that I'm going to pr produce here, and so that trickles back until we get to a point where where we have where we either stop producing or we have some kind of infinite queue that we can just store all of our backlog in, and that's what Kafka gives us, and that's what was happening. So it was clear to see that the back pressure is being started from our producer subsystem, and, and that was starting that back pressure. So. We can start describing this subsystem using Little's login. Okay? And we can see from our from our metrics that it was taking 0.5 milliseconds, not seconds, milliseconds, to process a message in our producer component. Okay? And so if we take our throughput again, which is 2,000 messages per second, times 0. 0.00005, uh, it equals one. And so this is this is what we are looking for, right? The math works out that from what we drew out for ourselves, it works out. We said we have one producer processor, and those all works out so that we have one message in flight. So, so we can see that we've actually, this means that we drilled down our, our systems to the lowest uh, granular subsystem. And so what do we do when we have this situation? Well, when we rewrite those log, it, it tells us exactly how we, how we deal with our bottlenecks, right? It says we can either increase our capacity, that's our L, or we can try to decrease the amount of time that it takes uh, for a message to go into end, right? And the amount of the capacity that we have is defined by the number of threads that we're running in the producer, and the time is defined by the activities that were happening there. And the activities that were happening there were JSON serialization and gzip compression. Okay, so we gzip our messages before we produce them, and those were kind of a little bit difficult, they weren't quick wins, we couldn't really intervene in how well we were doing our JSON serializing and our GZIP compression without a lot of work. What we could do is we could try to parallelize our, parallelize our work. Okay? Like we said before, we had more CPU to spare, we said, and there was no kind of stateful uh, entity that we, that, we, that we had to worry about. We could actually just add another producer and see if this worked and see if it freed up a bottleneck. So that's what we did, and that actually worked. So we freed up that, that first bottleneck in our producer component. Uh, but we, we were still left, we still had our, our sender queue was still full, okay? So it meant that even though we had a bottleneck in our producer, right, we, still, we still weren't at the, the throughput that we needed, that 3,000 messages per second. So we thought naively, okay, well, it worked for a producer system, we just added another thread, so let's just add another thread here too, and let's see, see if that works. Well, it didn't. If it did, it would just, that should be pretty boring. Um, and so, so then we said, okay, well, okay, let's try to understand this again with uh, Little's Law. And we saw at this point that the sender subsystem was taking now 0.47 seconds uh, to process the message. And now the throughput had gone, had gone up slightly, it had gone up to 2100. So that, that, that improvement of the producer subsystem had improved a little bit. And so this is what it looked like. And, and the number 1,000 actually made sense because we had this mechanism that was limiting the amount of in-flight messages that we had. And so we got this number 1,000, so we're like, okay, we understand uh, our system now. So all we need to do is we need to increase our capacity like we did before. We still had CPU to spare. So we said, okay, let's increase, let's increase that mechanism to 2,000 messages a second, or 2,000 in-flight. And that actually didn't work either, fortunately. Um, and what had happened here is that even though we had increased our capacity to 2,000 and our throughput was still at 2,100, what had happened is our latency, the, the waiting time, had actually also doubled. Okay? So 
this is confusing. We, we were kind of at a loss at this point. It's like, well, what's happening here? How come we can't manipulate our, our system to, to optimize the polling? So at this point, we realized that we didn't understand our system enough, and we so we decided that we needed to get a better look, and we used a tool that's called a flame graph. Okay? And flame graph, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a tool, it's a profiling tool that's developed at Netflix by engineer named Brendan Gregg. And what it does is that it actually can tell you the amount of resources all of your uh, methods or functions all, all of your, your card are using. Okay? A flame graph looks like this. Basically, what it shows us is that on the x-axis, it shows us the time on CPU per, per function. And on the y-axis, it shows us our call stuff. Okay? Um, and oh, I forgot to mention before, we write all of our services, or most of our services, in a language called Clojure, which is a language that compiles to the JVM. Um, and so flame graphs actually play really well with, with the JVM. They play well with uh, a lot of languages, but specifically with the JVM, it works pretty well. Um, so we could utilize this tool for our, for our services. And so what we can see here, we can see that we had this, this gzip compression. I'm not sure if you guys can see, but we have a tower here for our gzip compression. We have a tower here for our, our, our JSON serialization. But we also have this tower here. And it showed us that there was a lot of work being done by the, the third-party library that we we're using for sending our HTTP requests called HTTP kit. Okay? And so realize that we need to understand what's happening here in HTTP kit a little bit better. We zoomed in on our flame graph, and we could see what was actually taking a lot of time was actually not the, the sending of the HTTP requests themselves, but you see there was a lot of CPU being wasted on, uh, wasted, being spent on SSL negotiation and connection negotiation. Okay? And so actually when we, when we dug into to HTTP kit a little bit more, they actually understand a little bit more about how it was working and what was happening inside of it. And what we realized that when we called the HTTP kit request method, what was happening is that it wasn't actually sending right away, right? It was sending, it was putting that HTTP request into a queue, into an internal queue of HTTP kit. And then there was a, an event loop. For those of you who use Node.js or this is a common pattern, uh, we have an event loop that uses non-blocking IO that it kind of does this pattern, right? It's a single thread that you can manage a lot of HTTP or a lot of TCP requests on the same thread. So it doesn't block. It, it, it manages through a mechanism on the OS called EPO this kind of idea of non-blocking item. So a single thread can send lots of different messages and it basically gets alerted every time uh, uh, an HTTP request has, has changed its state. So we have three states, right? We have connect and we have write and we have read in an HTTP request. <laughs> And it's managing all those states, and it's managing it through this, this people uh, mechanism, and it's not blocking the thread. Okay? But what was also happening on this thread was that SSL and that TCP. So, so, it, wasn't, so it was being starved for resources, even though all it's supposed to be doing is, is, is managing these connections and managing this EPOL thing, and not supposed to be doing a lot of work. It actually was doing a lot of work. So, so that was the first subsystem that we saw. And then when and then the second subsystem that we saw was that there was this, this when, when the, the, the event loop finished and we had a response, it was putting, it was delivering that response to uh, an executor service. An executor service is basically just another queue and another uh, set of threads that we can use which deliver, deliver our response. So we actually had two subsystems hiding in our HTTP kit library that we didn't know about. So when we took those subsystems, and we flatten them into our to our drawing from before. We can see that actually our system looked more like this. Okay, we have these this HTTP client and this third pool executor in the middle now, and that that mechanism, which was limiting to a thousand messages, was actually limiting the amount of inflight for all of these subsystems. And what we can see is that all of the the requests, once we added some metrics, you can see that all of the, the the requests were actually not spending most of their time in flight in uh, in, in TCP or rather spending their time queuing up to be handled by that event loop, right? And basically because we were, we were limiting to 1,000, it was effectively being uh, controlled as a bounded queue. Um, okay, so the solution here was pretty simple from this point on out. We know what to do. We have a, uh, we have a bottleneck. We had more capacity than we tried from before. 
And so what we did is we just added another HTTP client, which is that subclass, which is the event loop. And that actually freed up our bottleneck, right? So from this point on, we're actually able to get the same uh, machines that we had before. We, we saw our CPU usage shoot up to near 100%. And we were able to handle that, that 3,000 messages per second uh, throughput that we needed. Actually, a lot more than that. So, so that's a cool story and all, but actually, I don't want to. The point of this, this this talk wasn't to talk about that specific example. That example was just the vehicle to, to talk about this kind of methodology that we can use for whenever we have uh, systems or services that we don't understand or that we're noobs or that. And when we want to approach them, we want to debug them for, for scale optimization. We kind of use this, I guess, recipe. We can break our our system into recursive subsystems until until the math works out with, with little zone until we understand what's the, defining our capacity and what's defining our our waiting time, what's defining our throughput. And then given the fact given and then we can make this decision. Do we want to increase capacity or do we want to try to decrease the, the time spent in a processor? Okay? And that's what we can do is we can do that as much as time as we want until we decide, okay, like we don't have any other tricks in our bag. We've gotten to see 100 percent CPU usage and we and resource usage and we don't we don't have any other ways to decrease the amount of time we use. And then we're at 100 percent usage. And actually, you know, the the, the the example that I used was pretty simple, right? It was just a pretty clear data pipeline, but it turns out that you can break down all of your systems into into these, these agnostic queuing systems, okay? You can apply Little's Law to all of them because Little's Law is actually applicable to any queuing system. As long as you understand whether your queues are bounded or unbounded, you understand your arrival rate, you understand what your in-flight is and your time, actually you only need two of them to decipher the third. Um, you, can, you, can, you can use this methodology, you can understand if you can free up your bottlenecks beyond uh, what, you, what you already have, okay? Um, and this capability is paramount as, to, as our ecosystems expand because because we're not going to understand all of the systems in our in our in services in our in our stack, and we need to we need to be able to to understand them quickly when when we've either joined a new team or when we're we're trying to help out another team. We need to understand these concepts and able to to get to that short loop that Don Knuth talked about very quickly without a lot of development. So I'm happy to say that Hotstar is still our clients. Um, and actually, not long after that happened, they, uh, they broke the record for the, the most simultaneous uh, live streaming uh, users of an event of all time during the, the Cricket uh, Premier League Championships. And AppSire also felt uh, you know, that, that spike when that happened. And because of you know, some of the principles that we use here in, in this service and lots of other services, we were able to be flexible enough to, to use, you know, various types of hardware and, 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 and optimize our services so that we can handle this, this spike in traffic. And that's it. All right.